My name's Serena Lillywhite. I work with Oxfam Australia and I manage the mining advocacy program at uh, Oxfam Australia. Uh, Oxfam Australia is a member of OECD Watch and I've been personally involved in working closely with the OECD guidelines for multinational enterprises for, for about the last seven or eight years. And um, that's provided me with a really good opportunity to really assess how useful the guidelines are in trying to improve corporate accountability and in particular the, the business conduct of Australian enterprises when they're working offshore and particularly of course in the Asia Pacific region and in conflict zones. One of the, um, one of the learnings I guess from the work that I've been doing is that um, whilst the guidelines have quite a lot of strength in that they do have a complaint mechanism and they are endorsed by governments. One area that still requires strengthening really relates to supply chains and we know that um, ensuring responsible business conduct throughout production networks and right down through supply chains, through wholesalers, through trading houses, through first, second, third tier suppliers, that's really where it becomes very, very difficult to uphold responsible business conduct. And as part of the upcoming review in 2010 of the OECD guidelines, we're really uh, hoping that those supply chain provisions are strengthened. Similarly, uh, we're really hoping that the human rights provisions of the OECD guidelines are strengthened as well. And a good example of that in Australia, if we take, for example, the extractive sector, um, the mining sector in particular, currently there are approximately 300 Australian mining companies operating in Africa alone. And of course, many of the countries where they're operating are conflict zones or post-conflict zones or at best perhaps a weak regulatory environment. And one of the real challenges that, that NGOs and in fact um, uh, those people involved in corporate accountability policy and advocacy work face is how we can really get strong implementation of not just the guidelines but other tools that exist internationally to uphold international standards to uphold the rule of law, uh, to uphold uh, even the principles that are set out in voluntary mechanisms in conflict zones. And so this is a, an ongoing challenge for us, not just in Africa, but closer to home in countries like Papua New Guinea, for example, where there are significant conflict issues and, of course, major uh, pipeline projects going ahead at this moment, the LNG PNG pipeline project. That in itself is a project that has strong support from the Australian Government through the use of our Export Credit Agency. And that's another example where we would like to see the OECD guidelines more closely linked as uh, a mechanism to determine uh, project financing or project um, appraisal, whether it be from a private financial institution, a private bank, or indeed by the Australian Government through its own export credit agency. Can a company be brought to task um, in, a, in a country uh, where it has its head office for activities happening elsewhere in the world, say in developing countries? It certainly can, and that's one of the reasons why OECD Watch uh, does provide uh, and is, is promoting, I guess, the guidelines, because it's, it's a tool that enables uh, us to give consideration to the activities of Australian companies, not just in Australia, but beyond our borders. So it's a tool that we can use to ensure that the principles of responsible business conduct don't stop at the border and don't provide an opportunity for companies that may do the right thing in Australia but uh, are less rigorous in ensuring they do no harm when they operate offshore. So for example, if an Australian mining company is, uh, is um, uh, not upholding the human rights provisions, is creating environmental um, havoc through its activities in, for example, uh, the, the DRC in, in Africa, then civil society within the Congo could raise a complaint to the Australian National Contact Point with regards to the activities of that Australian mining company in the DRC. So this in fact is one of the strengths of the guidelines is that it does have extraterritorial reach. 
And you do a lot of work with the extractive industry and the social impacts here in Australia. Do we have any examples of good practice there? Uh, whew, it's always hard to uh, choose a, a better company from a not so good company, but I think one uh, generalisation I can make is that um, certainly larger companies, whilst they're far from perfect, they at least have the, the resources and uh, uh, a better understanding of what they should be doing with regards to upholding standards. They have people uh, working on this to develop gender impact assessments, uh, to develop uh, in-country grievance mechanisms. They certainly haven't got it right, but I would say some of the larger mining companies within Australia are perhaps making some good progress. Um, I certainly wouldn't say it's best practice, um, perhaps it's promising practice, but what we do know is that the real challenge for implementing corporate accountability really falls away very quickly when you're talking about small, medium-sized or junior mining companies and of course they are the majority of the companies. You know, we only have one or two very large companies so if we've got 300 Australian companies in Africa, well that leaves about 298 um, small to medium-sized companies that uh, it's very, very difficult to know what they're, what they're actually doing. So upholding responsible business conduct remains a significant challenge for small to medium-sized enterprises. Thanks very much.